Well, then today is the Queen uh, Mother Jay Zima uh, Sunday. And then a uh, few days is Ash Wednesday. And the uh, Ash Wednesday, there will be a uh, mass here uh, so that uh, Father and I are going to go up to the visit uh, Montana. Rodrigo's coming up tomorrow. We'll visit Montana, coming up from Colorado. And then uh, we'll come back on Tuesday night, be Mass here at uh, 6, uh, 6, 6 p.m. on Tuesday night, and then on uh, Wednesday, Ash Wednesday at 7.30 in the morning. So it'll be a Mass at 7.30 in the morning on Ash Wednesday, and then we have to head out to the, uh, to the southwest. And so Father Hugo will be here on, uh, on Ash Wednesday uh, morning. And then the, on Sunday, the 24th, uh, the priest will be here for the Mass uh, in the afternoon uh, at, uh, hopefully at uh, 4 o'clock. And after the Mass, the testing of the confirmands. Uh, Bishop Williamson will be coming on the 25th for the confirmations in the evening of the 25th of uh, February on Monday. And then, uh, so Sunday we'll have the Mass and then the testing of the uh, confirmands uh, on the Monday. And so, I mean, the test of confirmands on Sunday after the Mass, and then on Monday will be the uh, confirmations with uh, Bishop Williamson. And uh, so Bishop Williamson will be here for two days, and the, the details and schedule are written up there on the, on the internet. But the Sunday Mass, the 24th, and then the 25th, the uh, confirmations. Epistle for the Quinquagesima Sunday, the last Sunday of the Septuagesima season, just before Lent. Take him of St. Paul's first letter to Corinthians, chapter 13. Brethren, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And if I should have prophecy and should know all mysteries of and all knowledge, and if I should have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And if I should distribute all my goods to feed the poor, and if I should deliver my body to be burned, and if I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity is patient, is kind. Charity envieth not, dealeth not perversely, is not puffed up, is not ambitious, seeketh not her own, is not provoked to anger, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth with the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never falleth away, whether prophecy shall be made void, or tongue shall cease, or knowledge shall be destroyed. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I become a man, I put away the things of a child. We see now through a glass in a dark manner, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. And now there remain the faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And then the Gospel. Take that according to St. Luke chapter 18. At that time when Jesus took unto him the twelve and said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things shall be accomplished which were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. For he shall be delivered to the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and scourged, and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they shall put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this word was hid from them, and they understood not the things that were said. And it came to pass, when he drew nigh to Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the wayside, begging. And when he heard the multitude passing by, he asked them, he, he asked what this meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they went and they that went before him rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried out much more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus standing commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I do to thee? And he said to him, Lord, that I may see. 
And Jesus said to him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he saw and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Thus far the words of today's holy gospel. Father and the Son of the Ghost, Amen. On this Quinquagesima Sunday, the last <coughs> few days before the beginning of Lent, in the last week, we read in the, the sacred scripture reading, in this last Sunday of the Septuagesima season, these three Sundays of preparation, three Sundays of preparation for the most holy time of the year which is the time of Lent. Next Sunday, St. Uh, Augustine would say on each Sunday, each, each year, he says, this is the holiest time of the year, the beginning of Lent, when there is a tithing of the year. And we must take the tenth part of everything and give it to God. Remember in the days of St. Augustine, there was no Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday was invented later, came later. Lent began on the 40 days of uh, the, the next Sunday, Quadragesima. And there were 36 days of fast between that day and Easter. And St. Augustine would say each year your first fast is a fast from sin. And that there are 36 days of this fasting because there are 360 days, 365 days in the year. And we must give a tenth part of all in a very sacred and special way to God. And this is the tithing in the most sacred and most holy time of the year. The time of the preparation for the death of Christ and the conquering of sin in the time of the pre preparation for the victory of the resurrection and the, the, the complete conquering of death and sin through Christ's death and then, of course, the resurrection which sealed his victory. And that we must conquer sin during this time that is coming. And this is the last Sunday of the preparation. When we consider Abraham, <coughs> we begin to read about Abraham in the breviary today. We're continuing the reading of the book of Genesis. Subject to Jason is Sunday. We read about the creation of the world. When God created the world, the soil was good. Last Sunday, we read about Noah. That God created a world that was good, but after He created man, man brought wickedness and sin into the world, and God repented that He made the world. So on Sunday, of Jason Sunday, God was good, was happy, because He created a beautiful world. On Sex of Jason Sunday, God is angry. Because he repented that he made man. And he decided he would wipe out all of men. And he went looking over the face of the earth. And he found that only Noah was pleasing to God. That only Noah found grace before the Lord. And therefore he decided to save through Noah the human race. And he built an ark. And he commanded Noah to build an ark. This was last Sunday. And we read about Noah's building of the ark. And the great deluge and wiping out of sin. And now man wanders away from God again. And this time we read about Abraham. And Abraham, the father of the church, tell us he is the great man of faith. And one of the great tragedies and great wickednesses of the last 500 years is that Protestants and Martin Luther and the, and the Calvins and the Protestants, all the various branches of Protestants, they came in and they destroyed the notion of faith. When we consider faith, we consider Abraham. And 500 years ago, 500 years ago, the notion of faith was changed to being only an intellectual belief. That faith is simply an intellectual belief. And it is not anything more than that. That if I believe in the 12 articles of the creed, if I believe in what is taught, and I am able to spit it out on a catechism test, or out in some kind of piece of paper, then I have faith. But this is not the notion of faith <coughs> faith is the substance of things to be hoped for it is the vision of things unseen the substance of things to be hoped for faith is the first virtue without which there is no virtue faith is the beginning of all things and faith is the most important St. Thomas Aquinas tells us the first virtue <coughs> and the most important virtue is the virtue of faith but nonetheless, our Lord Jesus Christ tells us that in this life, we say that charity is the greatest virtue only because charity can reach its maximum greatness in this world. Whereas faith is not completed until we see God in heaven. And since faith is not completed until we see God in heaven, faith is not perfected until heaven, whereas charity is perfected on earth. And therefore, on this earth, we say that charity is 
the greatest virtue, but still, strictly speaking, before God, and the first of all virtues is the virtue of faith. And then is the virtue of Abraham. We read today how God came to Ur of Chaldees, to a wealthy family, and He went to Abram, and He would change His name to Abraham, and He came to Abraham and He said to him, Leave thy country, leave thy kindred, and go into the land that I will show thee. And he did not explain to him the details of this land. But he said to him, you must leave your country, you must leave your kindred, you must leave your relations, and you must go to the land where I will show thee, and whoever shall bless thee shall be blessed. Whoever shall curse thee shall be cursed. And in thee, in thy seed, all the earth shall be blessed. These are the words that God spoke to Abraham. And he did not explain to him what they meant. And Abraham made an act of faith. And we forget that an act of faith is intended by God to be an act. It is not simply something of the mind. It is something that we do. Abraham got up. And St. Ambrose tells us, Why did God say to Abraham, Thou must leave thy country, and thou must leave thy kindred, and thou must leave thy relations? But why didn't he just say, Leave thy country? Because obviously when you leave your country, you're going to leave all those people in that country. You're going to leave your kindred. You're going to leave your relations. Why did he say this explicitly? Because God wanted to make sure that Abraham knew what he was doing. He knew that by following God, he would leave his family. He knew that by following God, he would leave his kindred and his relations. And he demanded that there be no ignorance in this matter. Therefore, he did not say, leave thy country alone. Because Abraham might not be that smart and may not realize that it also means to leave his kindred and leave his family. So he wanted to make it very clear, says St. Ambrose, that there will be no confusion in Abraham. He did not know where he was going. But he knew what he was leaving. Just like when our Lord Jesus Christ came to those five apostles, the first five apostles, and he said, come follow me. And it says, relictis retibus, leaving behind their nets. They had their hands on their nets. Peter and Andrew and James and John had their hands on their nets. And this was their means of livelihood. This was their, their means of sustenance. And when Jesus Christ said, follow me, they let go of their nets. And so the beginning of the faith, Jesus Christ demands, and God demands, that we leave our family, that we leave our country, that we leave our kindred, that we walk away, and we don't know where we're walking. Ken Ambrose said, they knew they were following God, but they knew not where they were going. And this is the beginning of faith. It used to be a game that the boys would play. It is called the faith game. Father Hugo has the boys play this game frequently. The faith game. Where the boy stands up on top of a fence, stands on top of a fence, or stands on top of a high, high place, and the other boys stand and hold their arms out. And he has to close his eyes and stand backwards and fall backwards. And if he has faith, they catch him. And if it's a bad faith, they don't catch him. But he has to decide, does he have faith in his friends or not? So when he begins to fall backwards, he can no longer retreat. He has pointed the, the, reached the point of no return, and so they call it the faith game. And this is what Abraham did when he left Ur of Chaldees. He left behind everything without any possibility of return. Very similar to what Cortez did. And Cortez tried to convince his uh, 400 soldiers of Spain to conquer Mexico. They were not sure what to do. They were not sure if they could conquer this great land and these great Aztecs. So Cortez went back to the coast where he had a, a few men guarding the ships and he burnt the ships that would take them back to Spain. He burnt them and he destroyed them. And he said, all right, we've got two choices. We can die here or we can rule here. You decide. He burnt the ships. 
He took away the possibility of retreat. Now the first condition of faith, and the first act of Abraham, was to take away the possibility of retreat. If you're going to follow me, says our Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know where you're going, you don't know what you're going to receive, you don't know what lays ahead of you, you do know what is behind. You have a certain security in your nets. <coughs> you have a certain security in your family. You have a certain security in your country. Leave behind that security. And do not look back. Remember what happened to the one that looked back. When Lot's wife looked back, she was turned into a pillar of salt. But we cannot look back. This is the first beginning of faith. One of the very great blessings of our time, and one of the tragedies really of the last 400, 500 years, and one of the tragedies of the time of glory of the church, one of the tragedies of the time of the glory of the church is that one can have faith and security in the world. One can have both the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and be secure in the world. And so we are not certain. Is this man living by faith who calls himself a Catholic? Or is he living by faith because faith is popular in a Catholic country? Because faith is secure in a Catholic world? And so while it is good to have a Catholic world, the faith becomes unsure. And one of the great blessings of these times of battle is that we go back to the time of Abraham, we go back to the time of those five apostles when they left their nets, following this man who had not yet built any churches, who had not yet performed many great miracles, who had not yet died on the cross for our sins, who had not yet shown his greatness. They just followed him. Because they heard a dove and a loud voice cry out and say, or a dove and a loud voice above in heaven say, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. And they heard John the Baptist say, This is the one, follow him. But they didn't know where he was leading. The first condition of faith, we leave behind whatever we had. We leave behind our country. We leave behind our kindred. And we must be willing to do this. Most souls are not. Abraham was a great man of faith. He left behind. And then he went after where our God led him. And remember when Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, he went into the land of Canaan. And when he was in the land of Canaan, God said to him, This is the land I will give to you. This is the land that will be your land. And I will give it to your seed. And you will have more children than there are stars in the skies. Now when Abraham began his journey, he was 75 years old. He was 75 when he left Ur of Chaldees. He was not 20. He was 75 years old. He was married for more than 50 years. And he had no children. And God said to him, Your wife has been barren for 55 years. But I am going to give you more children than there are stars in the heavens. And you follow me. And he followed him. <coughs> Did he have any children? No. He went to the land of Canaan. And he told them, this is going to be your land. And guess what happened in the land of Canaan? The book of Genesis tells us there was a great famine. There was a famine. And though people were starving, and it was a very great famine, and, Cain, and, and Abraham, in order not to starve, had to go to Egypt. So he went to Egypt. And he went to stay in Egypt... When he went into Egypt, he realized that his wife, Sarah, was very beautiful. And he knew that the king of Egypt would see, the Pharaoh would see, the wife of Abraham would kill Abraham if he knew it was his wife. And so he told Sarah, tell, tell Pharaoh that you're my sister and not my wife. And that way they will bless me because of your account. And so he lived. And he stayed in Egypt. And then after a time, God began to send a scourge on Egypt because of Sarah. And then Pharaoh found that it was not his sister, but his wife, and then he sent him on his way. But Abraham, when he arrived in Canaan, there came a famine. The land that was going to be given to him. Every time that Abraham listened to God, there came a trial. 
there came a difficulty, even though there may also have been blessings at the same time. And he had he never doubted God. He had a complete confidence in God. And God demands this faith and wants this faith of us now in this time of crisis in the church. We must have a great faith. Abraham had that faith and he is the example for us. So Abraham went to Canaan and there was a famine. And after the famine, he still believed in God. Then he went down into Egypt and he still believed in God. Then he came back. And now 20 years later, he still has no children. He still does not have any children. And God still told him he is going to have more children than there are stars in the skies. Finally, Isaac is born. And when Isaac is born, he turns 12 years old. And now Abraham is over 100 years old. And then God tells him, I want you to take your only begotten son Isaac, take him to a high mountain, and kill him. And he listens to God. This is the faith that God wants of us. He somehow still believes that though he can have no more children, though he had this miraculous child, though this child is 12 years old, though there does not seem to be any other possibility, he must always obey God, and God will bless him, and he still will have more children than there are stars, and he still will be blessed. And when he is ready to take his knife and kill his only begotten son, the angel says, Abraham, touch not thy son, because thou hast feared God. Touch not thy son, because thou hast feared God, because thou hast obeyed God. And we must be ready to obey God wherever He wants to lead us. And remember the great faith of Abraham. Abraham did not have the example of the saints before him. Abraham had only his faith. We know the examples of the saints. We know the example of Abraham. God gave us the example of Abraham. God gave us the example of so many saints down the last 2,000 years who met so many difficulties, met so many obstacles, and yet all these obstacles were overcome. All of them were overcome. And he blessed anyway his church. His church that was persecuted down the last 2,000 years nonetheless flourished. The saints who were worked in adverse circumstances and attacked on all sides, nonetheless were blessed by God. We must have confidence that the same God that was good to Abraham will be good to us. But faith demands action. We cannot say that we have the faith if we don't live it, and we don't put it into practice, and we don't act on it, and we don't make decisions based on it. If you must decide, the time is coming when the laws of our country will make us decide. Do you want God or do you want the world? And if we follow the laws of our country in the near future, we will have to turn away from God. Are we going to pay for abortion? Are we going to promote abortion by our health insurance and the Obamacare? Are we going to accept the, to violate the law of God in order to keep a job? When you read the first 300 years of our church, not all were martyrs. There were some cases in northern Africa, for instance, where the magistrate of Rome told the local Catholics, including the bishop, if you do not worship these false gods, we will take away your rectories. We will take you out of your churches, the small churches they had at that time when they were in between persecutions. And you will lose your positions in the Roman Senate. And you will lose your positions and you will lose your jobs. And you will be having to live in poverty. And entire cities turned away from God. Entire cities of Catholics following the Catholic faith, when they were threatened with a loss of job, when they were threatened with financial difficulties and a loss of their status in Roman society, they turned away from God. This is the most effective persecution of the devil. When he throws us in prisons, when he tortures, we find in those first 300 years the majority did not give in. They, did, they were happily tortured and they were happily martyred. But so many, when they were threatened with the laws of finance and threatened with the comfort of their own houses and threatened with the loss of their own jobs, they turned against God. This time is coming again. And it's already here. It's coming again. We must have faith. 
that we cannot follow demonic laws, which are going to increase and increase as the years go by. And we must be ready to follow Christ into the desert. We must be ready to stand up against the modern laws, because the laws are coming. They are coming that are going to be impossible for Catholics to follow. And when they come, we have to be ready to be thrown out of our houses. We have to be ready to be thrown into the streets and then have confidence that God will take care of us. We have to be ready for these things. The time is coming where you can no longer have the faith in your mind without also putting it into practice. The time will come when we have to choose, like the three young men in the fiery furnace. They had to choose. Will you worship the true God and be thrown in the fiery furnace? Or will you burn incense to the false God and save your life? And that time is coming back in which we will be asked to burn incense to the false gods of materialism, the false gods of the new laws, the false gods of the new world, or maintain the faith of the true God and accept the consequences. And we must ask the grace of the Blessed Virgin Mary and ask the grace of our Lord to have the faith of Abraham. To be ready to follow no matter where our God leads and no matter how bad things seem to be, having confidence that He will give us the victory. And also this faith cannot be called faith if it is not lived in charity. The Father is called the living faith. Our faith must be alive. And this faith that is alive is alive when we live in charity. The St. Paul speaks about in the Gospel. And the epistle. We must have charity. And the time of Lent is a time to increase charity. To make charity and faith become closer together. To not let them be separated. That our divine love and our divine faith can never be separated. And that as God created all things for himself, so we must use all of our powers and all of our, all of our being to bring all things to God and to see God in all things. We must follow the divine teaching. And the proof, says St. Gregory the Great in his sermon for today, of this faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ told his apostles, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed. He is going to be handed over to his enemies. He is going to be mocked. He is going to be scourged. And he is going to be put to death. And then it says three times, They did not understand the things that he said, Neither was it understood, neither did they understand the things that he said. Three times. They didn't understand, they didn't understand, they didn't understand. They did not understand that he was really going to die. They didn't understand he was really going to be scourged. They didn't think it was possible. But he told them that they might be warned. And they, they still believed in him and they still followed him. And then in order that they might understand through a miracle, he cured the, mind, the man that was blind. And know this towards the end time, says St. Gregory the Great. The man is blind on the side of the road. And these are our times. And the followers of Jesus Christ are traveling with him down the road. That is the members of our holy church. And the man says, who is coming? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. We are Catholics. We are bringing with us Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We are bringing with us the true God and the true faith and the true sacraments and so on. And the man says, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the people who are the followers of Christ say, be silent. They tell him, be silent. As we are being asked to be silent today. Be silent. Don't speak out. Don't beg for mercy. We are with Christ. He doesn't want to be bothered by you. Blind man, a beggar on the side of the road. And it's important that he was a beggar. It's very important. Because remember in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, our St. Peter went up to a beggar who was, who was lame. And the beggar said, I beg of thee in alms. I beg of thee in alms. And St. Peter said, Silver and gold I have not, but what I have I give thee. Now remember, this beggar, there are many blind beggars. We see them all the time, especially in the many of them there in South America, traveling there last week. Many, of course, in Asia. They are made blind. In India, they take them and they make them blind. They take a little boy and they gouge out his eyes. 
And they make him blind. And he spends the rest of his life on the side of the road begging. And his blindness is his is his, uh, what makes people feel sorry for him. And he spends the rest of his life begging. Now this man was a beggar. And there were many blind beggars on the side of the road. He was not the only one. Remember also in India, seeing the blind beggars, they're normally together. You see two, three, or four, or five of them. They're in little groups, not just one. And it must have been that way when our Lord Jesus Christ passed by. But there were many beggars. And the other beggars that were blind were begging for money. And this is the problem of today. The majority of Catholics who are struggling in this crisis of finance, they are begging for money. They are begging for support and financial support. But they are not begging for mercy and they are not begging for faith. This beggar was blind like many other blind beggars. But he was different. He said, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. And this is what we must say during this time. And what happens? The Catholics say, be quiet. Don't beg mercy. Don't say he's the Son of God. Don't say he's the only answer to your troubles. Don't beg forgiveness for sins. Why? Because the Catholics traveling with Jesus Christ were living in sin. And they were guilty. And they were not filled with the love of Christ. Just like in the church today. And he said, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. When they told him to be silent, he cried out the louder. And that is what we must do in these end times. Finally, our Lord heard him. And he did not hear him when he first cried. Remember, there was a woman that touched his garment. in a big crowd. And instantly, he said, who touched me? But the same Christ, who felt the light touch on a garment, could not hear this man. So likewise us. When we cry to Christ, He will not hear. We must cry and cry and cry. We must beg and beg and beg. And only after a time will He finally hear. Then He came up to the man, What do you want? Most beggars who are blind say, I want money. I want alms. But this beggar said, Lord, that I might see. And St. Gregory the Great tells us, He said, Lord, that I might see. In order that He might perform a miracle of sight, in order to be able to transform the blindness of his apostles, because his apostles were blind. He explained to them that he was going to die, but they didn't believe it. He explained to them he was going to be scourged, but they didn't understand. His apostles were blind. And therefore Christ, who was hurt that his apostles were blind, came down and saw a beggar on the side of the road, and he cured his blindness. So likewise in our church today, the apostles are blind. The bishops are blind. The Pope is blind. So many of the church are blind. The priests are blind. Those in the mainstream church are blind. They are blind, though Christ has said to them, what is his life? What is his being? What is necessary for the church? But they don't believe. The church must also be crucified, just like Jesus Christ was crucified. The church must be scourged, as he was scourged. And the church will rise again, as he rose again. But they don't believe. So therefore he goes to beggars, and that is us on the side of the road. And he cures our blindness, that we might see. And also says this St. Gregory at the end of his sermon, Did he not say that he was the way, the truth, and the life? Had not the beggar been waiting along the side of the way, he could never have found the truth. And so it is with us. We must find ourselves begging on the side of the road. And then the truth one day will pass by. And when it passes by, we must cry out. And we must beg. Because the truth passes by, and the truth doesn't stop. He is on his way to Calvary. He is on his way to his Father. He is not stopping on his journey. And so we are on the side of the road, on the way. And on the road, Jesus Christ comes, says St. Gregory. And we must cry out to be received the truth which will forgive us our sins. The truth that will give us strength. And we have only a limited time to cry out. And he will pass by. And he may never come this way again. First is the way, says St. Gregory. And when we are waiting along the side of the way, on the side of the road, Christ comes. And then comes the truth. And we beg for the truth. And if he opens our eyes, we receive the truth. And then what? We follow him. And when we follow him... We follow Him to a cross. And after we have reached that cross, and have received the death that the world calls death, we will have life. And therefore these three come in order. The way, the truth, and the life.
Let us beg along the way. Grab on to the truth when it passes by. It may not pass again. And follow that truth into eternal life. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.